This is a USB to RS-232 adapter and in this tutorial we will use it to control a bunch of LEDs from our computer. But instead of LEDs you can also control all kinds of other electronics with it, like the scrolling text display from last time, hooked up to a laptop and working as a typewriter. Hi, my name is Jens and I believe that everybody can learn electronics. In this tutorial I will show you how you can use the RS-232 serial module of a PIC microcontroller. Here is what you need. An 830 pin breadboard, a 4.5 volt AA battery compartment and of course also the batteries, an RS-232 breakout adapter, the PIC16F627A microcontroller, the MAX-232 integrated circuit, three 1 microfarad capacitors as well as eight LEDs and eight 220 ohm resistors. You also need the USB to RS-232 adapter cable, the PICKIT 3 with a 6 terminal connecting cable as well as single stranded wire and I recommend American wire gauge 24 or 0.6 millimeters. You can find a detailed list of all of these components on friendlywire.com if you click the link in the description. Alright, but what is RS-232? It is a really old but versatile communication standard that can be used to send and receive data between two devices. That could be a computer and a microcontroller, two computers or even two microcontrollers. In the simplest case that we will talk about today, RS-232 uses three wires. TXD, which stands for transmitted data, RXD, which stands for received data and ground. These data lines can be one or zero and in RS-232 land a logical one is minus 12 volt and a logical zero is plus 12 volt. Let's say there is a sender and a receiver and we want them to talk to each other in RS-232. The ground line goes through like this. Then we connect the TXD line of the sender to the RXD line of the receiver so that when they send something it arrives on the RXD line. And the RXD line of the sender is connected to the TXD line of the receiver so that whenever they send something back it arrives on the RXD line of the sender. This crossing of the wires is also called null modem configuration and we will make use of that later. Okay, but how do we transmit or receive data with these wires? Maybe you notice that there is no clock line, so how can we tell when one signal is over and the other one begins? Signal protocols like this are called asynchronous and you need to specify a transmission speed, which is called baud rate in this case and describes the number of bits per second. This is just like Morse code. If you can't agree with your friend on what is a short beep and what is a long beep, you're gonna have a bad time. Almost always we are sending 8 bits or 1 byte in a row with RS-232. This is because the ASCII code, which stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, assigns each number from 0 to 255 a special character, which is very useful for transmitting text. Here is how the signal looks like for the letter J. Let's put in a timing grid which is fixed and given by the baud rate. When nothing is going on and we call that the idle state, the TXD line is kept at a logical 1. The signal always starts with a so called start bit, which is a logical 0 so that the change can be detected. Then we have the 8 data bits starting with the least significant or lowest bit and ending with the most significant or highest bit. In ASCII the letter J is 74, which is 01001010 in binary and that's these numbers here. But they're backwards because we start with the lowest bit and end with the highest bit. And at the end, to finish up, there is the stop bit, which is always a 1. And then we go back to the idle state and everything else can begin all over again. There are many more details to RS-232 and if you're interested go check out the companion article to this tutorial later. Okay, enough chit chat, let's go ahead and build our LED controller. This is how the LED controller works. Each one of the eight data bits controls one LED and whenever our circuit receives a byte from the computer, like our letter J from before, it updates the LEDs. And just for fun, it also sends any byte straight back to the computer. So you see, it's pretty basic. At the end of this video I will show you that you can use this simple setup and control quite complicated electronics as well, like the scrolling text display you can see behind me right there. But for now, let's take a look at the LED controller schematic. In the middle you can see the PIC16F627A microcontroller and it is connected to our batteries with this switch here. This symbol is the power supply for the MAX232 level shifter IC, more on that in just a second. At the bottom you can see the 8 LEDs connected to the outputs of the PIC. The interesting part related to RS-232 is this stuff over here on the right. 
This symbol is the RS-232 adapter and pin 5 is ground. Pin 2 is RXD and we connect it to the TXD output of the MAX-232. Pin 3 is TXD and we connect it to the RXD input of the MAX-232. And yes, this crossing of the wires is the null modem configuration we talked about just a minute ago. But hey, if you get confused with TXD and RXD when you're building the circuit yourself, don't worry about it. The LED controller won't explode or anything if you connect them the wrong way, it just won't work. If that happens, just switch them around and then everything should be fine. The MAX-232 is a level shifter that we need so that we can translate the plus and minus 12 volt signals that RS-232 uses into the 0 and 4.5 volts that our microcontroller uses. The MAX-232 uses the capacitor C1, C2 and C3 to generate these voltages and it's important to get their polarity right. And that's it. But how do we tell our microcontroller to talk over RS-232? The PIC16F627A, like many other PICs, has a built-in USART module. That has nothing to do with the United States, but stands for Universal Synchronous and Asynchronous Receiver and Transmitter. Yeah, I know, it's a great name. But setting the USART module to RS-232 mode is not that hard, because we only need to set a few registers in the source code. Check out the tables 12.4 and 12.5 in the PIC16F627A's datasheet and you will find the correct values for many possible baud rates. We are running our PIC on the 4 MHz internal oscillator and since we're aiming for the slow baud rate of 1200, we need to set BRGH to 0 and SPBRG to 51. This is how it looks like in the code. The configuration bits set the oscillator mode to internal, which is 4 MHz for the PIC 6 and F627A, and then we set the BRGH and SPBRG registers. Then we can set the mode to asynchronous, enable the serial port, turn on interrupts for receiving data, and turn on the receiver. Because we are using interrupts, we also need to enable both global and peripheral interrupts like this. The main loop is pretty simple. It takes the received byte that is stored in the variable value, checks what bits are set and turns on the corresponding LEDs. LED 1 is bit 0, LED 2 is bit 1 and so on. But wait a second, how does the byte get into the controller? Whenever our PIC microcontroller receives a byte over RS-232 from the computer, it automatically runs the interrupt service routine or ISR for short. The received byte is prepared for us in the register rcreg, fresh from the digital oven, and we can just read it out like this and store it in the global variable value. After that, just for fun in this little tutorial, we'll send the byte we just received back to the computer. This is how we do it, and of course this is also how you would send any other data to the computer if you ever wanted to. These last lines here just clear some potential error analysis bits, but I find that a detailed error analysis is not really needed in most hobby applications. I know that this is a lot of information to take in, so I wrote a detailed companion article to this tutorial that you can go check out later and that will hopefully fill in all the blanks. Now that we understand this code, we can take it and compile it in the MPLAB 10 IDE. This creates a hex file and that hex file has to be transferred or flashed onto the PIC16F627A so that it knows what to do. This is the circuit we need to do that and here is how you build it step by step. Connect the PIC kit 3 to the programming circuit we just built and plug the USB cable into your computer. Open the MPLAB 10 IPE, type in PIC16F627A under device and select the PIC kit 3 as the tool. Open the power tab and select power target circuit from tool, then go back to operate, click on connect and then on OK. Now you can load the hex file which you can also download directly from my website if you want to. Click on program and after a few seconds the hex file has been transferred to our PIC16F627A. Now you can remove the PIC from the programming circuit and put it aside for later. Check out the link in the description for detailed and beginner friendly step by step instructions if you want to give this a try yourself. You can also check out my PIC introduction video right here. Don't get discouraged at this point, I know it's a bit much the first time. But later you realize it's really not that difficult, you only have to learn it once and it's totally worth it. And now we're ready to build the circuit. First let's wire up the RS-232 breakout connector. Connect the blue TXD wire to pin 2, the yellow RXD wire to pin 3 and the black ground wire to pin 5. Put the rubber grommet back in place and close the connector. 
With the 830 pin breadboard in front of you, place the PIC16 F627A in row 36 with its notch facing to the right. The MAX232 goes next to it in row 34 with the notch facing to the left. Don't be confused by these circles, the notches are here and the pins are numbered like this. Next, connect the power to the PIC at pins 14 and 5 and at pins 16 and 15 for the MAX232. Red is plus 4.5 volt and black is ground. At this point, it's also a good idea to connect the power rails on both sides of the breadboard like this. Next, place the three capacitors C1, C2 and C3. They're all of the same value, but make sure you get the polarity right. The negative terminal has a big minus sign on it and make sure the negative terminals are located here and the positive terminals are here. Now connect the RxD and TxD lines between the MAX232 and the PIC16 F627A like this. The 8 LEDs go in next with their cathodes pointing to the left. When you're looking at an LED, the cathode is always the short wire. Each cathode gets its own 220 ohms resistor that connects it to ground. Now it's time to wire up the LED anodes. I try to make it symmetrical so that it's easier to remember how to connect stuff. The second group of four wires goes on top of the previous four wires like this. The LEDs are labeled like this and the most significant bit is on the left. This way we can read off a byte directly and the LEDs mimic a binary number. Now place some double sided tape on the right and fix the RS232 adapter to the breadboard. The blue TXD wire goes to pin 14 of the MAX232 and the yellow RXD wire goes to pin 13. You can plug the black ground wire into the ground rail anywhere you want. And last, plug in the 4.5 volt battery compartment into the power rail and our LED controller is ready to go. Great, now what? To control the LEDs with RS-232, we need to run a so-called terminal program on our computer. And that program does all the RS-232 talking for us. I'm using the program HTERM, which you can also download on my website, but you can use something else. There are dozens, if not hundreds of free terminal programs out there, so choose the one that works best for you. Plug in the USB to RS-232 adapter. The RS-232 end plugs into the LED controller and the USB end goes into the computer. Then start the terminal program and look for the new connection, which is COM6 in our case, but maybe a different number when you try it out yourself. Set the baud rate to 1200, the data bits to 8, the stop bits to 1 and the parity to none. Make sure that both ASCII and binary are selected here. Then click on connect and set the type down here to binary. And now comes the magic part. We can finally control our LEDs. Type in a sequence of ones and zeros. Let's say we type 11110000, which is the number 240 in decimal. Press return and voila! The LEDs match that pattern and we have just sent that byte out to our LEDs. And up here, we even see that we receive the data back from our circuit. The character with the ASCII code 240 that we just sent here in blue cannot be properly displayed by our terminal software, but that's why we selected the additional binary option in green, and we see that it's a perfect match. This is a proud parents moment that we should savor because our electronic child is talking to us for the first time. Changing the type to ASC, which stands for ASCII, we can also send the letter J. And just like we talked about before, the LEDs display 01001010. I am a little bit worried at this point that you might think the LED controller is boring. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to convince you that it's actually super useful. Sure, we're only driving eight LEDs, but imagine that you can connect these eight LEDs to almost anything you want. Now, if you remember, the scrolling text display uses data clock and strobe, so there's three wires to send data to these LEDs in here. So I connected LEDs 6, 7 and 8 to data clock and strobe and this program just translates the keystrokes into the correct pattern so that these characters actually appear on this screen over here or on those LEDs I should say. So let's run the program on the left here. This is how it looks like. I like this, it has very minimalist, it has like a nice 90s matrix style vibe to it but that's not really the point. The point is now I can start typing. So let me type something, let's type something nice, hello. And you see over here, it actually appeared on these LEDs. Now it's a bit hard to read. So I pushed, uh, pushed space a little bit. So now the display is clear and I can write something else, maybe in caps, oops, maybe in caps. Hello, something like this, uh, exclamation mark, 
stuff like this. I can't go backspace because, um, you know, every new character comes in from the right, but I can just press space and clear the display. And one thing that I really like is whenever I type something, can be anything, you see the LEDs, they're going through some, some pattern here, right? And this is really the data that we're sending over RS-232. So you can really see on the one hand the abstract data that is being sent and then what that data means on this display over here. I really hope you find this RS-232 tutorial useful and give it a try yourself. I know it takes a bit of time to get it all up and running, but it can come in extremely handy and I know that I will use RS-232 in many of my future projects. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what else you want to learn and I will see you next time.